A Girl on the Shore is a manga published in 2009 by Inio Asano. I would say of all of the manga that I've ever read, Inio Asano might honestly fall into the top three manga artists in my mind. He manages to create stories that are just so rooted in reality, yet at the same time are almost surreal in its storytelling. And Girl on the Shore, while only being two volumes in length, manages to do that in really astounding and somewhat explicit, yet controversial, yet beautiful way. It's one of the most difficult manga I've ever had to explain to anyone, and as much as I want to recommend it to people, based on its contents and just how open-ended and floaty and almost non-story it is, it's really difficult for me to recommend it to someone, even someone who loves manga and has read a lot of it. But don't get it twisted, I love A Girl on the Shore, Umibe no Onnanoko as it's called in Japanese. It was actually one of the first Inyo Asano books I ever read after my girlfriend recommended it to me, or rather she showed me and introduced me to Inyo Asano with A Girl on the Shore, Umibe no Onnanoko. And I was really thrown aback at just how different, yet almost familiar the manga was to me. I can explain the basic plot of A Girl on the Shore, but in doing so, it doesn't really serve much of a purpose, as Inio Asano's plots in almost all of his manga don't really matter, because when you do just hear the plot of A Girl on the Shore, or any of his stories for that matter, you might honestly be thrown off by it, by how simplistic it sounds. But I guess that's where the magic of Inio Asano manga comes into play, with just how simplistic of a plot he uses, and yet manages to convey and portray and visually stimulate, as well as emotionally stimulate the reader in how profound of a simple plot can be. It's really difficult to explain, and as much as I do want to just keep talking about how brilliant Inio Asano is, that's not the point of this video. The point of this video is that uh, just a couple of hours ago, as of me recording this video, I went to go watch the live-action adaptation of A Girl on the Shore. It came out less than a month ago, and uh, I was immediately excited to go watch it. I'm generally not excited to go watch live-action anime films, is if you might know in, from my main channel videos, but this one was somewhat special because A, it is a live-action Inio Asano film, and he's had a pretty good track record in the past with the live-action adaptation of his first manga, Sorani, which in my opinion was a pretty damn good live-action film, even if you didn't know it was based off an Inio Asano manga, just with, again, how rooted in reality the plot is, it was destined to become a live-action adaptation, and thank god it ended up being an actually pretty good one. But compared to a lot of his other manga series, Sorani is very much tame in its subject matter. And as fucked up of a territory as Inio Asano is able to delve into, I don't think he's delved into as much of a controversial cesspool as he has with Umibe no Nanoko. Because although his most famous work, Oyasumi Pun Pun, really did redefine the idea of depressing manga in a lot of people, uh, A Girl on the Shore goes a lot more explicit. It is basically a manga exploring teen sexuality and the psyche of troubled and damaged teens growing up in an environment that doesn't welcome healthy mental stability. It is dark, it is gritty, and it is quite explicit. Inio Asano doesn't really sway away from showing the physical sides of teen sexuality. Now, obviously, I'm not going to explicitly tell you what happens in the manga because YouTube, but also I feel that A Girl on the Shore is almost best experienced going into it completely blind. And I'm sure you've heard that from a lot of different manga series when, when there are so, like every other manga I hear when it is being recommended. The, the tagline that is always plastered on the front of the review is, I could explain this to you, but you should go into a blind if you want that full experience. But in the case with Girl on the Shore, and a lot of Inio Asano's manga, is that it's, again, really difficult to even describe what the plot is, because for half of the time, you almost forget that there's even a plot. Inio Asano doesn't so much orchestrate a story, as he more emotes a story. He so much just shows the raw emotion 
in a full frontal manner and gets the reader, or in the case with the live action film, the viewer, to decide how they would like to portray the characters, the story, and everything in between. And pairing that with a very open-ended story that almost ends in a really anticlimactic, non-ending type of ending, A Girl on the Shore ends up being one of the most difficult and yet profound manga series to process and talk about. So naturally, when I heard that they were going to be making a live-action version of this somewhat explicit, I would say even the most explicit Inio Asano manga, I thought, god damn, how in the hell are they going to adapt some of these scenes? Because mind you, the two main characters, namely Koume, the protagonist, and Isono, the boy in question, are both in middle school. But then the question rises, how in the hell are they going to do that with real actors? Because if you look at the cover of this film, you can tell that, uh, you know, for better or worse, they did a very, very good job of casting said characters. I think there wasn't really a room for error in terms of the story, or there really wasn't any room for failure when it comes to the presentation of the story, because again, the original manga is only two volumes long. So as long as you follow it to a T, that's pretty much enough material to cover a 140 minute movie. And it certainly was enough to cover it, and the, I guess, directional aesthetic as well that they decided to go for for this film was very minimalistic, it was very artistic, it was very, I guess, almost black and white film levels of silent, and it was doing so well when, again, I found out that World's End Girlfriend, who is an artist, a Japanese artist, who I personally am a massive fan of, when I heard that he was doing the music for this entire film, the soundtrack to this film, I was floored. I thought, oh my god, this is going to be an amazing movie. It's one of the most profound and just brutal, in a lot of senses, Inio Asano manga. One of my favorite mangakas getting a live action adaptation and an artist that I respect in all sorts of different ways doing the soundtrack for it. And I thought that was going to be a match made in heaven. Underline the words, I thought. Because this movie was so close to being good. There were just a couple of glaring issues with the movie that just made it fall a little bit short of the pass mark, in my opinion. As much as they did a really good job casting the characters, as in all of the actors pretty much look the part of all of the characters from the manga. Koume looks like Koume from the manga, Isono looks like Isono, and all the other side characters pretty much look the same. But if looks was all that mattered in a live-action film, then there wouldn't really be point of casting actors. Because the acting in this film was, uh... not very good. Especially the two main characters, Kome and Isono. I don't know, it's it's not even like... Japanese acting levels of bad, it's, it's honestly just like... just bad acting in general. The actors who played Kome just delivered lines in a really flat almost monotone sounding way, even in emotional scenes where she was getting angry or she was getting sad, and not to mention her facial expressions were just, like, non-existent. For almost the entirety of the movie, in every single scene that that actress was in, her facial expression looked exactly the same. It's like she could only make one face and emote one emotion at a time. And the actor who played Isono was also not very good, but at least he did a good job in emoting. Like, when he was angry, he looked angry. When he was sad, he looked sad. But then on the contrary, that causes a different problem, because if you compare Isono, the live-action version, to Isono in the manga, it's almost like two completely different characters. Isono in the manga is more so the just straightforward, very little expression type of quiet characters. Like, you can't really even tell in his facial expressions when he truly does feel some sense of emotion or if he's just hiding it in a shroud of irony. So in a way, the live action almost switched the two main characters' personalities around and that caused a dynamic that just didn't match very well. It made it almost seem like Kome was more damaged of a character than Isono was when if you've read uh, Girl on the Shore manga, you would know that that is absolutely not the case. Not to say that Kome in the manga is not damaged 
in the slightest. Of course, she is damaged, but that's the, where the true interesting dichotomy of the two main characters in A Girl of the Shore kind of come into play when it comes to the message that Inyo Asano wanted to portray in this story. And the second biggest problem I had with this movie is more so in just the the concept of even adapting this movie in the first place. I feel that Inyo Asano must be one of the most frustrating mangakas for any kind of movie director or screenwriter. Because again, his manga is almost plotless. Or rather, the plot is not the main point of his manga. It's almost like he has a plot there just because he needs to have a plot there to make it some kind of a cohesive story. Because as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, it is very difficult to explain the plot of A Girl on the Shore. And I truly think that explaining the plot doesn't really do A Girl on the Shore justice because the main plot of A Girl on the Shore is not the main point of A Girl on the Shore. The plot just follows two kids who are learning the difference between romantic sexual encounters and physical sexual encounters in a coming of age type of story where Kome, our main character, kind of starts to have feelings for a guy that he was just using to basically let out sexual frustrations because she's not having a great time romantically. She keeps getting declined by guys who interest her and not getting declined by guys she doesn't care about. For more of you attentive viewers, you might have just realized that me explaining the plot of A Girl on the Shore did not actually explain the plot of A Girl on the Shore. Because with Inyo Asano, his plots are so not important to the overall message that he wants to portray in every story. Me trying to explain the plot of A Girl on the Shore basically just led me down the path to break down the meaning of A Girl on the Shore. And I think that's the exact point that Inyo Asano is trying to bring. And I'm no movie director or screenwriter, but if my entire point on a movie is to create a cohesive storyline that my viewers need to follow along while watching this movie when trying to adapt a show whose plot is so not important to the overall creation of said work must be one of the most frustrating things on the planet. This is at a point in Inio Sano's career where unlike Soranin, he got really experimental with this story. He got really emotive. It's just nothing but raw emotion and you as a reader have to just face that emotion and deal with it in the best way that you can. And the ending of this story and this movie is so open-ended and so almost not finished that it almost seems like Inio Asano forgot to write an ending. And again, that might come back to the whole point of maybe there was no point to the story. Maybe there was no story. To be honest, once you do start to break down a girl on the shore in its themes and its message that it wanted to portray and how it portrays said message, whether that be through dialogue or the explicit scenes that are strewn throughout or the different routes that each of the characters and decisions that each of the characters decide to embark on as a result of the things that they experienced, there really almost is no point for an ending because that's not why we travel that distance. There's a lot of authors who try to create self-insert stories in many ways, whether that be through power fantasies, whether that be through second uh, person narrators. You know, there's lots of ways that you can do self-insert stories to get the reader to feel like they're part of the story. But I feel Inu Asano doesn't so much do a self-insert narrative as more of a anybody insert narrative. A lot of the points of his stories, and especially A Girl on the Shore, is the whole message of this can happen to anyone, and this has probably happened to everyone in varying degrees. Sure, it might not be as explicit and as fucked up as A Girl on the Shore, but to varying levels of degrees, if you did grow up in your teens, in whatever environment you did grow up in, then you've probably experienced at least one of these kinds of emotions at least once in your life because that truly does define the meaning of growing up and that truly does define 
this idea of teen sexuality, this thing that every teenager, regardless of what kind of sexuality you have, goes through in some kind of degree. And so after hearing all of that, after hearing all of that open-endedness, if you were a screen director, or if you were a screenwriter for this manga, how would you try to tackle this? Because as much credit as I want to give to the directors, it was really uh, just a... It, it, it was a sore effort. But again, I don't blame the director, because I feel this honestly might be one of the hardest manga series to adapt into anything outside of a manga. So for those of you who are impatient and don't really give a fuck about my deeper feelings and just skip to the end to figure out some kind of numerical score of the Girl on the Shore live action, um, I would have to give it like a, like a strong 5 out of 10. 5 out of 10 for effort. It was an okay film. It definitely wasn't horrible. I've seen some horrible live action films, but it definitely doesn't warrant a second watch. Rather, it honestly made me reread the manga the moment I got back, and it's super easy to read through the manga because again, there's only two volumes of this, super short, you can get it done in half an hour if you're a quick reader. But watching the film definitely made me open my eyes to just the brilliance of Inio Asana and really reassured me as to why he truly is a genius. If I have to recommend A Girl on the Shore to anybody watching this video, I would first and foremost recommend it to people who gave it a go originally before watching this video, but dropped it because they thought it was just some kind of lewd, hentai-esque type of just sexual jargon and garbage. Because I think you're really doing a disservice to Inio Asano by just throwing this story away in that type of category, because it couldn't be further from that category. I get it, if you're not used to that kind of subject matter, it is a little harrowing to read, especially since it is told in a very real and very just brutal upfront type of way. But if you're okay with that, and you also want to kind of get a, a deeper sense and truly the most like mature recounting and mature dissection of teen sexuality in manga then you have to read Girl on the Shore. And again I say this with full seriousness, A Girl on the Shore is almost not a story and that's a big task for any kind of movie director and screenwriter to try and tackle on the big screen, and, you know, as much as they tried their best, it, it was just okay. But World's End Girlfriend was fucking fantastic. I, I definitely recommend World's End Girlfriend. Like, his his piano skills and the fact that he's, like, a classical composer that uses, like, glitch techniques and whatnot in his uh, soundtracks, really freaking dope. Yeah. Really cool. Listen to World's End Girlfriend. That shit's tight.